Uh, so, yeah, we'll start with this one. Just, you know, have you ever had that experience of uh, walking into a museum and you're not quite sure, did the janitor just like leave his stuff in the corner or is that really a work of art? You know, there's always uh, these cartoons out there that people are looking at. Well, let's take a look at this, this uh, fan right here, you know, and uh, is this a work of art or is it just something somebody left behind? So I don't know if you've had that experience. I certainly have had that experience. Um, but, um, you know, these are actually um, bits of candy. And we'll revisit that, but I just thought we would open with that one. It's a pile of candies in the corner of the museum. You know, it's like, Let me ask happened? you something. How does the, whoever allows that to be on the mm -hmm. museum, it put that in there as compared to a little kid that just threw a bunch of stuff together? Mm -hmm. And how do they look at what the kid did in that and right. say, we're going to, that's, art and it's going in the museum, but what that kid did right. is not. Yeah, and, and a lot of it has to do with context, that which surrounds it. So that that's the difference. So you have a context of the kid with the candy, that's its context. The kid made, you know, through that pile of candy, right. so that's its context. And then you shift that over, it may be basically the same pile of candy, but it is an artist that's actually chosen the candy, brought the candy to the museum, gone through the sort of the rigmarole right. of being selected to be in the museum. But how do I know that's not you some don't. kid that you threw don't. something together and for whatever reason looks the same way as that yeah, little you look. don't. You don't. Yet the five-year-old kid is not an artist, but this guy that's is. That's right. That's absolutely mm -hmm. right. And, well, and then, yep. And so. If it was a kid, it would just be rappers. Yeah. Right, exactly. That's right. There wouldn't be any candy. But, but good point. And, uh, and just hold that idea because, you, you, and I, I've been through exactly the, where you've been through, and I don't even know if I've like moved on very far away from that. But if you can remember context, because that's really what um, the shift is from, say, um, modern to postmodern, even modern. Uh, dealt with context, right? You take a Pablo Picasso and he looks at, you know, the seat of a bike and he's like, wow, that kind of looks like, you know, the head of a deer, antlers right. of a deer and so on. Um, so it's about meaning and context, not necessarily about the literal thing because art isn't really about the literal thing. The, the art is a holder for the idea. So that's another thing that we have to think about that it becomes almost like a symbol or a a placeholder for things well, for what meanings. What would the context be of that? And we'll get into okay. that. Okay. I'm, I'm gonna. I just wanted to kind of provoke you a little right, bit. Right. I certainly provoked you. Yeah. So that's a good thing. Yeah. Um, so we we rarely have problems with um, these kind of things, yeah. right? We can see them. There's a little bit of realism in there. Um, it's beautiful, not dead, gorgeous, beautiful, beautiful. Sandro uh, Botticelli in the Renaissance right. creating this one, the Birth of Venus. Um, so it's no problem because. It's basically appealing to our sense of beauty, a sense of order, a sense of uh, calm, a sense of um, you know reality. You know this kind of reality business, even though it is a two-dimensional you know picture plane because it is illusionary. But we usually don't have any problems with that one. It's just when we start like seeing things like this that all of a sudden we start going like, hey, wait a minute. You know my four-year-old daughter or sister could do that or what's the difference between you know this this pile of candy and the other pile of candy well it is about um, symbol it's about meaning it's about context too so just keep that in mind that it's not just like it's not literal it's not literally a pile of, well it is <laughs> but what art does is it takes it to different levels. So we take the pile of candy and then we start building meaning and surrounding it with context and that together creates the work of art. That pile of candy that the little kid did doesn't have the meaning, doesn't have the context. But, but I heard artists say it's not the meaning, you know, what's the meaning of this and that? It's right. just there. It's a work absolutely. that you look at. And uh, look, yes, absolutely. And, look at the and time and Time again, when you ask artists, okay, so you know what's that all about? What's the symbolism and whatever? And they'll say, well, what do you think? You know, they throw it back at you. 
uh, because they want you to participate in the creation of it. They want you to derive meaning, your own meaning from it. And very rarely will they say, oh, this is a symbol for, you know, my mother's death and da 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 like that. So, you know, it, it, it's all there. So I wanted to start here because we have Marcel Duchamp and he, to, for me, really encompasses um, that kind of breaking out of the mold when you had back in the, um, like in the like late uh, turn of the century, like 1890, um, turn of the century, 1901, during World War One and things like that, he was starting to say, you know, like this idea of always painting things that's supposed to represent something else. He just didn't, he thought art could be something more. So he says here by World War One, he had rejected the work of many of his fellow artists as retinal art, so the idea of like, well, you go into a museum and you use your eye to recognize it, and what he wanted to do was also to engage the in intellect. So there's very many ways in which we experience art, right? There's sort of like the intellectual way, right? That's sort of up in the brain. And then there's the uh, heart, right? That's more the emotion. And then there's sort of the full body experience, the kinesthetic experience that we, we might have with art. So um, think about that way in which we appro approach and appreciate art. Um, so he was one of the first to do this thing called a ready-made. He, he actually uh, named it. Um, he attached a bicycle to the stool and um, he just said that this is, this is my creation. And so the idea uh, was to, the, to question the very notion of art and art as in capital A right there. Uh, and the adoration of art, which Duchamp found unnecessary. It was interesting because um, he was part of a, a group of artists that uh, were really forward-thinking. And they said, okay, we're going to have an art show. Uh, it won't have any uh, declines. That means everybody will be allowed in. It'll all be anonymous. And uh, so he's like, okay, this sounds great. Because they were tired of the, uh, the French Salon. The French Salon was sort of this... Uh, very long and winded um, establishment in France, and they really were the dictators of the uh, the taste of the time, and they were just getting tired of it because it's like, well, why are they dictating? You know what what's in and what's out. So let's get my friends, artist friends, together, and so this is what he submitted, and it is quite literally a urinal. So he goes to wherever he, you know, I don't know if he went to a plumbing shop or whatever, picked it up off the street, and he signs it R Mutt. And he dates it 1917, and he brings it in. Actually, he doesn't bring it in. One of his friends, a female friend, brings it in, and then the organizers of the show are just like, "Oh my God, we just can't. We can't have this. This is just terrible." You know, having a urinal in your show. This is just can't, can't. So they had to decline it. So of course, do do shop. You know, just is like, well, why don't you? Why are you rejecting it? Um, so there was an interesting quote here, I'll read it. Mr. Mutt's fountain is not immoral, that's absurd, no more than a bathtub is immoral. It's a fixture that you see every day in a plumber's shop window. Whether Mr. Mutt with his own hand made the fountain is of no importance, he chose it. And so that's the sort of the distinction. There are a lot of artists now today, uh, don't, they don't make their work. They have a huge studio and they have employees and they're the ones making, like Jeff Koons. He doesn't make his work. He's made art, but he doesn't right now touch his work. A lot of the um, work that he does, he gets the idea, sends the directions off to an engineer or the foundry, and boom, off it goes. So don't use the qualification of, you know, the artist actually has to make it because that's been blasted away already. Um, he took an ordinary article of life, placed it so that its useful significance disappeared. And so this is when we talk about context the useful significance disappeared. It means that he's giving it a different context because he says, okay, this is a beautiful shape. We're going to place it into an art show. And so now the context changes and its meaning changes. Um, under the new title and point of view, created a new thought for that object. So what we have to do is keep remembering that a part of, an, of, of art is not just the object itself. It's the meaning, it's the context, it is the intention of the piece. Um, so that just is kind of an interesting one. And I love this one. This, to me, I remember seeing this, uh, I, took some, I took art history in college, and seeing that for the first time, I was just like, wow, that's great. This is Merritt Oppenheim's work. She was a friend with uh, Pablo Picasso. They hung out together, and she was an artist in her own right. And it all started with uh, 
you know, they're hanging, having lunch or whatever, and uh, somebody said, do you want any more tea? And somebody was joking and said, yes, I'll have, I'll have tea with a little bit of fur on it, meaning that they wanted it warmer. And so she thought, wow, tea with fur, and what, what a crazy sort of juxtaposition to expect your, your teacup to be like porcelain, right? You want to drink from it. And how, what, a, what an opposite thing that she has created, like this fur, you know, the fur-covered teacup that just is working with dichotomies. Um, so this idea, of, I've, I've said this word again, context, and what the artist will do a lot of times is decontextualize it. That means take away the original context of this teacup, which is what? You take the tea, you drink your tea, you clean your cup, blah, blah, that's the context. It's in your kitchen, right? And now we decontextualize it. That means just shift the context to some other purpose, some other place, some other meaning, whatever it is, and you get a new, a new concept, a new idea. And we could do that actually without even changing the form of the original teacup. We could do that. As artists, you can do that. So um, what I'll be doing tonight is looking at these five categories, because I thought at least to, to punch a hole into this thing, we're going to look at appropriation. That means uh, taking somebody else's work and re, well, sometimes recontextualizing it or giving it new meaning. Uh, integration of time, so that's supposedly the fourth dimension, right? We've got we've got a length, we've got a width, we've got a height, and the fourth dimension is time. So we're going to see how time is integrated into or introduced into artwork. Uh, for the longest time, text, words, letters. You would never have letters in you know a Renaissance painting. No, no, no. Um, but nowadays, text is a big thing. You look at Basquiat's work or, or whatever, a lot of times they're integrating text into the work. Kitsch, anybody know what kitsch is? Kitschy, right. That's sort of the low brow kind of, well, and now it's high brow. It's somewhere between camp and, I don't know, it's those little chotskis sometimes you have in your kitchen or Damien your Hurst. neighbor has to, give me an example. Do you have an example? Damien Hurst, Kitch. yes, Kitsch, <laughs> and also uh, um, Coons, Jeff Coons, uh, and social, social injustice. So what uh, artists, contemporary artists do today is to take up uh, a cause, say for instance, um, you know, treatment of, of migrants or global warming or something like that, and create a work of art to highlight that, um, that, that issue. Uh, so that it brings awareness and um, people are better informed about it. So I have a question. those are the things. What, what's yeah. this made out of? That's actual fur. fur. That's fur from where? Uh, good question. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's from and, an animal. What's animal? The, cup, the cup is made of. And underneath the cup is the actual uh, porcelain teacup. So that's an actual cup, and then the and fur. It's covered is with in fur. The, yes, yeah, I would imagine she used glue. Yep. Yeah. Uh -huh. And she calls it object. And that was Paris, 1936, which is pretty. Pretty uh, forward thinking for her. So uh, we'll take recontextualization, retextualized um, art first. Here's a Cindy Sherman. She's been working for uh, many, many years. She's had shows at the, the MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And what she does is she kind of she reinvents herself through um, the photographing of herself. She does these great elaborate sets these costumes she designs, and then she puts herself into uh, sometimes historical figures. Um, these are historical figures that throughout time have been um, painted by artists, and so she's sort of confronting us with um, herself as she places herself in different contexts. So this is her um, biblical figure of Judith. Um, there have been um, artists in Caravaggio and Gentileschi have done this. Mm -hmm. So there she is. This is a photograph of her, so I'm assuming that there is a, she sets it all up and then someone actually photographs her. And that is like if you buy a Cindy Sherman, you're buying a photograph. Um, so does anybody see anything odd or strange about it? Does anything, how do you feel about it when you look at it? It looks like he's still alive, the head that she had. Oh, there. the head looks like he's still alive. Okay, so the story of Judith. Uh, there's an Assyrian uh, uh, general, and she goes in the cloak of night and uh, takes a knife and takes, takes the head right off of the general. 
she kind of seduces him, you know, gets him drunk and psh, off goes his head, and then she frees her people by, by um, doing that because the general is dead. Um, so that's a historical, that's a true story. Um, it's a historical um, story. It's in, the, it's in the Bible as well. Um, so anything else? Anything else weird that you see? Well, there's no blood, so if she there's was no blood. Good, she didn't yeah, cut off the head. Why yes. is there any blood? So no blood. That, that's been hanging around. That no. doesn't look like uh -huh. it was hanging around for a while. Yeah, it right. like with yeah. So she's got these pretty lush uh, fabrics. Um, what's kind of strange is this sort of drape around her um, middle as if she's almost pregnant, right? There it is, but it doesn't show up on the screen. I remember that from last time. That's okay. Um, she tends to do some kind of quirky things. In fact, if you look at the head, the severed head, it actually is, she purchased from a, sort of a Halloween store. So it's this kind of like this weird kind of, you know, like it's a mask, so it's kind of weird. So she does some sometimes upsetting or unsettling things with her work. Um, and there she is, so she looks far from very different when she photographs herself. And this historically, this is a um, Cristo uh, Fano on the uh, up above. So you can see that throughout time, um, this subject has been revisited again and again. This is Artemisia Gentileschi, one of the few uh, famous female artists in the Renaissance. And so there you have your blood. Um, and this one is um, uh, Baroque. And um, no, that, yeah, Baroque. She had a cool story. She has a she's an amazing story. So if you're if you want to dig deeper into Artemisia Gentileschi's, it's an important subject for her. It is exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So there was a court case. She was um, she was molested, um, raped, and um, during that time period, um, it was just brutal in terms of if you actually did um, you know press charges in that regard. I think, I think just, the guy paid her father off in that. Yeah. Yes. Her, that's right. So her yeah. father so was she a did painter. This painting about right. This exactly. Good. Exactly. So just in terms of um, say yeah. injustice <laughs> or women's rights, yeah. the whole business. So that would be reflected in um, possibly Cindy Sherman's uh, you know selection of the subject matter. It wasn't just that you know she just chose this sort of randomly. No, there's a lot of uh, emotionally charged. Um, background to it. Yeah, absolutely. And she's fairly young there, 21, right? She yes. 16, yes, her father. Or Caravaggio was a pretty young guy. Yes, he was. He's an interesting guy, though. Yeah, really crazy guy. Did he, he, did he, he kill long. somebody, then somebody murdered him? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, no, he, he died on an island, um, and he died alone, and he died of malaria. Oh, oh okay. Yeah, he was, was, he was on the, he was on the land. Was they were after him. He killed somebody. What's that? He killed somebody. He did. In the bar. He, yeah, and it was over a, a tennis match. Oh, jeez. He had tennis. Yeah, tennis match. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, he was a pretty good he was artist. A pretty, yeah, he was amazing. Was amazing and unfortunately, car. he didn't live for yeah. for too long. But his his work is amazing. Uh, so there she is again. So his, her makeup is heavy handed, almost tacky. The fabrics at first seem to glimmer, but they're sort of cheap and and chintzy. And then we mentioned about the Halloween mask. Head. So it is about illusion, it is about um, artifice, in it. and then as you mentioned, sort of this undercurrent of um, is social injustice too. Can you go back to that one? Uh, Whoop, yeah, that one. Yeah. Is yeah, it yeah. just me or does she have huge feet? Yes, she does. She does, she does. And I'm not sure if those are, I don't think those are actually her feet, but that's one of her things and I don't know if there's an explanation to it. I think she just likes sort of the quirky. Uh, but good, good eyes. Yes, those are enlarged feet. And I, I, like I said, I don't know if those are actually her feet. But we'll see some other weird things as as we as we go. Um, so this is another one of hers. Uh, this is based on a series of. Uh, uh, paintings that she did uh, of old masters. It's funny because when she went to Rome, she didn't go see the painting. She went and looked at books. And so that just puts another layer of sort of um, artifice onto her subjects. Like she wanted to see them flat. She didn't want to see the real thing. It said, um, I worked out of books with reproductions. And it's an aspect of photography I pre appreciate. Uh, conceptually, the idea that images can be reproduced and seen anytime, anywhere by anyone. So that's actually her. So that's a photograph of Cindy Sherman, all dressed up in the makeup and so on. I don't know how she got that bicep. Maybe it was some makeup or some 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 putty or something, or maybe she's that buff. Uh, but there you can see um, the young um, 
this is Caravaggio, and it's, it's wonderful that you mentioned Caravaggio because Caravaggio there is on the on these are both his. Uh, this one is known as um, the sick and young sick Bacchus. It's actually an early cell portrait, which is interesting, and that is one a later one. But you can see his his beautiful uh, technique and uh, talent for rendering the form. And then that one compared to Cindy Sherman on the right. So this is obviously the sick Bacchus that she was trying to um, trying to uh, emulate. And then of course the sick Bacchus. Who is Bacchus? God, uh, God of wine, sort of the bacchanal, you know, kind of oh, hangover you? kind of idea. And then you get this sort of you know pale skin as if uh, he's just you know burning the candle at both ends and, and not very healthy. It seems strange to go all the way to Rome just to work I that know! Out. <laughs> How could she do that? That's maybe she's been to Rome a million times. That's a This one, just this one I love. Um, this one is another one of Cindy Sherman. And um, here's it says, oh, who do you think was the inspiration of this photograph? Do you can you kind of name the time period or the artists even because these are Marie being Antoinette. inspired yes exactly yeah. Marie Antoinette and that's the Rococo time period which is the end of the Baroque um, all that kind of um, opulence and overspending of uh, Louis the 14th 15th and then eventually the 16th and then Marie Antoinette and the 16th get beheaded so yes this is kind of a depiction of um, this is emulating that um, Marie Antoinette kind of thing with all the fluff and frill and the pastel. And in this one, you can also see her kind of clothed feet, which is really bizarre and weird. It, the, the photograph is kind of um, cropped, but you can see that sort of awkwardness of the, um, the large feet. You know, because historically, right, females' feet are supposed to be small, right? And even, even with the Chinese, with the binding of the feet. Um, so this is just sort of, sort of her blowing that out of um, you know out of the water in terms of that concept that you know beautiful women should have small feet. See, I don't see this as abstract. I see this as humorous, almost like yes. fucking fun. So it is. I don't see that as you know abstract or whatever. Con you know, contemporary. I mean, yeah, con uh, maybe I don't. Yeah. Humor was always there, so I mean, yeah. It says so. Yeah, does does uh, contemporary art have to be abstract? Yeah, I won't call that abstract. I'm asking you the question. What does contemporary art have to be abstract? No. Okay. No. Good. So, no. Good. Well, no, but I thought we were talking about abstract. Uh huh. Uh, abstract. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I thought we were talking about abstract. Absolutely. Contemporary art uh, can include uh, abstract art. Okay. So that is, so we have contemporary art as a large umbrella, right. and then under contemporary art we have abstract art, right. and we have performance art, and we have photography, and we have installations, and okay. we have... So I must have misread it, I thought we were talking about abstract uh -huh. art, we yep. talking about contemporary art. Contemporary art, yes, right. contemporary art. The bow. Um, the bow, yes, the bow. <laughs> yes. The bow that seems so out of, out of, um, you know, it, it doesn't seem like it belongs. So uh, Madame de Pompadour or Marie Antoinette. Madame de Pompadour was really um, an interesting character in history. Uh, she was the, the mistress of the king, the French king, um, but she was very intelligent, very learned, um, and really um, gave the king a lot of like really good advice. So that was kind of interesting. Uh, king Louis the Madame de Pompadour is um, 15, 16, the 16th. Yeah. So it's the feet again. The feet again, <laughs> yes. She says here, I don't think anyone even realizes that on the bottom right corner are these big toes on a huge foot. Is that I thought, right? what Sorry, a beautiful power. I, is that what they're taught right there? Uh, yeah. There's or two of them, yeah. Her two feet right here. Okay, and okay, I, okay, I okay, mentioned okay. that it was cropped a little bit too. Yeah. So she says, what if she's this beautiful pow pow powdered wigged woman, but then she's got these big uh, feet sticking out. And that's it, the, the humor, right? So it's good. Yeah, and the idea so, of what a beautiful woman's supposed to be look, and she's exactly. kind of poking it exactly. by saying, poking well, yeah, that. you could have big feet That's and right. beautiful. That's right, exactly. <laughs> so Madame de Pompadour, and then this is just uh, of the same time, time period, that Boucher, the swing, which is just so frivolous and ridiculous and humorous, right? Because down here, it's actually a bishop that's swinging his mistress. You've got the <laughs> cupids are kind of like, oh, da da And then here is the lover, and the lover is just like perfectly positioned so that when she lifts her petticoat and her legs, it's like, voila, you know, it's just titillating and, 
and um, farcical. So. Is that her shoe fly? Yes, and her little mule <laughs> kicks off. I just love it, you know, in this sort of romantic uh, environment. And then you have this statuary here, this little Cupid, and she's going, Shh, you know, like, don't tell anybody. It's all secret, hush, hush. So it's, it's definitely um, very uh, sensual in terms of its, uh, how it, you know, how we respond to it. Um, so let's just talk a little bit about integration of time. Here's abstract. Yes. Okay, there good. Go. All right, good. there, now we got it. Jackson Pollock, and you probably know a lot about Jackson Pollock. He was one that sort of blew the doors open in terms of, uh, he wasn't the first abstract artist, but he certainly was uh, one of the leaders. Um, and when he laid that canvas down on the floor, because he didn't paint upright, he just rolled out, he takes some uh, buckets of house paint, and he takes the sticks, sometimes they were sticks, sometimes they were um, household paints, like large paints, and he just starts, you know, dripping and whipping and things like that. But what is cool about it is that there, in, in all the confusion and all the chaos, seeming chaos, there is order to it. When these are analyzed, there's actually like a rhyme and a reason to it. And there's also time, too, because those layers are being overlapped. So this is Blue Poles by Jackson Pollock. This is Convergence, um, and so 1952. So, you know, unfortunately, he, uh, he had problems and ended up in a tragic car accident, truck, uh, truck accident. How would he get the names for, like, why is that Convergence and the other one was Blue Poles? Yeah. Is there any? So I'm not sure if he ha has been asked, you know, the, the titles or, or whatever, but um, I, it's, and it's like with any, any uh, any title that an artist has ever given, it's like a lot of times, especially if it's abstract, it's usually what the first thing that pops into their head. Uh, you know, it's like, oh, what's the title of that thing? You know, and then they just like pop pop a name out. Um, so I don't think, I mean, with blue poles, I'm assuming that these are sort of these implied, you know, poles there. And convergence is probably something to do with, you know, this disparate objects coming together, but I, I do not know. Um, so time also is integrated into um, the new media of, the fairly new media of video. So let's just take a break and we'll uh, look at um, Bill Viola's um, video and sound installation. This is absolutely beautiful. Um, he is a artist who is practicing today. I just saw his most recent one, which is called The Raft, which is awesome. It's based on uh, The Raft and the Medusa by Jericho, which is a romantic artist. and. Um, he, uh, he loves to um, videotape things at very slow, slow um, speeds so that we're sort of like um, forced to slow our life down, right? Because we live our lives pretty quickly, right? We're in our car, we jump, we're in, you know, like it goes and goes and goes and goes. He wants us to slow down. He's been meditating for like, you know, 40, 50 years or whatever, but um, pretty amazing. So. Let's do this. We have to reclaim time itself, wrenching it from the time is money maximum efficiency. You make room for it to flow the other way. So let's do, let's see if I can do this. I apologize if there's some kind of ad going on. Is it showing on your screen? Because it's no. not showing um, on the... Mine is... Because um, okay. there's a setting in PowerPoint you have to change to... Uh, Can you help? Yeah. Usually at school I just click it. We need to go... All right, we need escape. to go to PowerPoint, yeah.
can I just switch over to uh Yeah, if we exit Yeah, Because I can just X out and go to the yeah. internet. That's right. That's, that's in some museum, is that it? Yeah, so it will travel. Um, mm -hmm. So, it, you know, you'll see it in different locations, like, uh, where did I see this uh, raft? Oh, man, where did I see it? I can't remember where I saw it. Uh, yeah, it's in Florida. Yeah, it's in Rome, actually. So, um, yeah, so his work is very, very inspiring. Um, you know, the elements of fire and water, air, uh, that sort of idea of self emoliation right? The kind of um, reducing down the ego, possibly. So it evokes a lot of sort of universal themes. So that was the idea of time there. And then the integration of text, which I said, or uh, mentioned before, which is really unusual. And here's a, a Chinese artist's name is Zhu Bing. And what he did was create this book from the sky, and this is known as an installation, so a very specific spot um, created. And when we look at it, just sort of it should be reminiscent of a landscape. You've got a wall, you maybe have reams of uh, paper that reminds you of maybe wind or a cloud, and then here's some rolls of paper, kind of maybe ripples of a, of a river. 
Um, but as you look more closely, you'll see that they're actually Chinese characters. And so word, the characters, so um, text, and what does it bring? It usually brings meaning. The symbols evoke a meaning. Um, so these are hardbound books. So he's been working for, he lives in the United States for 18 years. He was actually really a, interest, he was a kind of a, you know, uh, a stunning artist during the um, uh, Cultural Re Revolution and he actually created a lot of the uh, propaganda um, posters and things like that for Chairman Mao. And then became very disillusioned with the propaganda and how it was being used. So that's when he immigrated. And uh, he invented a thousand new characters. So basically, when you look at his piece, all these characters, and there's you know over a hundred thousand of them, uh, they mean absolutely nothing. So it's kind of a um, insight or reflection of um, what is propaganda and does it have meaning? Does what are the symbols all about? So I thought that was kind of cool, just to be kind of these idea of an installation is sort of an immersion, right? We I talked about the three ways that we kind of experience art, right? The the art of the heart, the mind, and the body. And this one involves the body because you get to like explore it with your body. Um, it's quite large, and you kind of feel the immensity of it. Did you write the? Did you write the? What would you call it? Did you write the description? Like, descriptions of the photograph. Did I write Did you write them, or is that the description that came with them? Like, like which yeah, one? This I'm, one I'm interested in the word harnessed. The idea that this harnessed. He was harnessed by the state. Yeah. Um, did you write that, or did I did not write that. Okay. Comes in, what is I it? I did not write that, and uh, I should have qu quoted it. It, it comes from Khan Academy. Okay. Khan Academy does a great job. If you're ever interested, mm -hmm. um, has anybody explored Khan Academy? Mm -hmm. K H A N. Oh, it's just fantastic. I mean, it's just like a whole world. You can take courses, and, and you know, it's just amazing. So, but I think that one cut came, came from Khan Academy. Well, what do you take Horace? I mean, you know, just the was, idea that the you know the Communist Party had just sucked them in. And oh yeah, and like took them in, and you know uh, made made them made him their property. Yeah, and correct. This, this is what you're going to do. That's with, right. With your talent and, and your and yeah, your freedom gets um, yeah. compromised, right? Because yeah, human you, being was harnessed. That's right. Yeah, 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 yeah I guess that's the right word to use. Yeah, usually yeah. you think of harness as like harnessing an animal. Yeah, so that you, you're controlling it, so the government's controlling it. Yeah. yeah. So I thought that was an interesting. Ah, uh, the idea of kitsch. You know, this this whole idea of kitsch, I. Know, it, it, you throw it out there and it, it seems to be quite um, appealing to some people. Um, so kitsch, the definition, art objects or designs considered to be in poor taste because of excessive garishness or sentimentality, but sometimes appreciated in an ironic or knowing way. I think you're getting this idea that a lot of contemporary art has an element of humor in it or irony or paradox. Um, the lava lamp is an example of 60s kitsch. This is uh, here Jeff Koons. And uh, he's putting, you know, this is supposed to be like a Barbie doll or Farrah Fawcett or whatever. And then she's holding, you know, the Pink Panther. I mean, it's just sort of ludicrous and strange and sexual and, you know, just all wrapped up into it. He's also poking fun at or, or highlighting this idea of consumerism or the commodification of art. The idea that when you really get down to it, you know, an artist has to make a living. And so what kind of compromises is the artist making so that his or her work is marketable or becomes a commodity? So that's another thing that they're taking a look at. Um, so Kuhn's created sculptures highlighting everything that he had considers wrong with contemporary American consumer culture. But when he, when you ask him questions, he'll just be like, no, he'll just turn it around. He'll never like tell you anything about his art. It's just like, you know, it's for you to decide. Did these folks try to do something that they figure is going to sell or did they do well, it because, well, because, you know, it's the art, you like it, yes, you don't buy and, it if and, you don't. And you know. that's exactly the the thing that's the whole idea that's the whole idea of this oh, yeah of that one yeah but i mean but somebody want to buy that yeah you, you but see. of coons yeah definitely because he was about like well let's let's be upfront about it let's let's create things that people are going to like see personally like I understand that, but I won't want that in my house. No. Do you see? No. So, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, who's going to be buying? I guess the museum would yeah, buy Yeah, right. Buy. Right. <laughs> exactly. 
Yeah, it's a, it's a funny thing. So, he, you know, a lot of people either love or hate Jeff Koons. Uh, some of them think he's a complete charlatan. Other people say he's just a phenomenal artist. Um, it's up to you to decide. Uh, he grew up, his hometown is in New York, PA, which I think is very close to where, no, Pittsburgh, uh, Andy Warhol was, was, was Pittsburgh. But uh, he's rich and famous today. He's got a huge studio. Uh, he's got over 100 employees. He's just rolling in it. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Uh, you've seen some of his, the rabbit, right? The sort of, the, uh, the, the it's like the Playboy logo, right? Um, so very similar in sort of a parallel way to uh, Andy Warhol and this idea of commercialism and pop art and things like that. Um, so there it is again, just crazy. He's got one of Michael Jackson and a, monk and a chimpanzee, just crazy. This one uh, is interesting. So he takes two vacuum cleaners and he puts them in a beautiful like showcase and um, he is saying that basically I've changed the context of this thing. And one receives objects as rewards for labor and achievements. Every, everything one has sacrificed in life in the effort to obtain these objects has been sacrificed to a given labor situation, the sort of like transactional um, thing that goes on. And once these objects have been accumulated, they work as support mechanisms. So he's talking about sort of this, this uh, consumer um, uh, culture that we're in. I have a question. Yes. Uh, he got a hundred assistants. Well, how do you know the assistant didn't do that? He, the well, assistant probably did do it. Okay, we so know that. but he's going to get the same money as if he yes, did it. Yes, yes. Don't you love it? I know. How about that? So, so really, it's a business operation. It's not could hard. Be. It could be. Could be. You know. So yeah. He, could be. Um, you know. Yeah. <laughs> right. He's 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 smart. He's making a lot of yeah. money. A lot of then, a lot of fiction books are written that way. Yes. Today. That's right. Yeah. Um, yes. And, and it yeah. does, it calls to mind uh, consumerism and, yeah. uh, you know, like, art, well, and he's art doing money. just and he's, that. He's, he's throwing it in our faces. Yeah, he's totally he's saying, doing Look, it. I'm rich because that's of right. And he, make, it. he makes no bones about it. He, he just, that's what he, exactly what he says. Well, who's that and, guy, Kasabi? Uh, the yes, guy Kasabi. that paid $6 an hour and people yes, are yes. spraying and they yeah. sell it to these celebrities right. for hundreds of yeah, thousands. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is this is what's going on. So uh, these are really quite uh, beautiful. I don't know if you've seen these in, in person, but they're really quite stunning. They're uh, actually a, a stainless steel, and they have a, um, a uh, you know enamel over them, so they're they're really amazing. But he's not touching them. He doesn't he doesn't touch these things. He doesn't create them. Um, so and then the last category is art used to expose social injustice. Um, and this is a new, uh, not a new concept. Um, we have J.M.W. Turner um, back in 1840 um, painting the slave ship. Uh, so he wanted to bring about uh, an awareness of what was happening or what happened with this one. The story goes that there was a uh, there was a slave ship coming in, and the um, the word got out that uh, the slaves were starting to get sick. And so the insurance policy was that if they were lost at sea, they could get the insurance. But if they were sick, they couldn't get the insurance. So the captain gave the order to just jettison out like the majority of the slaves. So you can see in the lower right-hand corner, um, just an upturned leg, and the leg is actually shackled. This is a really bad picture, but it's right here. The slim leg is coming out, and then there's shackles. Um, and there's a few things in the water that um, give us that we, we realize that those are actual human beings in the water and they've been just, um, you know, tossed about because um, they are no longer worth any money. So really um, tragic um, event that Turner actually um, read in a newspaper and wanted to bring it to um, more light because it was kind of hush-hush because the, uh, what happened, the captain was, um, some kind of connections where he got off without any, you know, repercussions. Um, so this is a uh, interesting um, a, a combination of um, uh, materials, mixed media. This is by a woman whose name is June Quick to See Smith. Uh, she's Native American. This is trade gifts for land, uh, trading land with white people. So as you can imagine, uh, the canoe is uh, very much uh, revered by the Native Americans because the canoe uh, was something that they could you know, travel around in and um, trade and uh, they uh, saw it as had a lot of value. And then up above are sort of the trinkets and we know the story how Manhattan was bought for, I don't know, it was just like nothing. You know, the exchange that happened between the white people and the Native 
Americans. So if you look real closely, what you'll see is um, there are, you know, Kansas City Chiefs and other things where the name of Native Americans are being used as a commodity, as people are making money off of the name of the Native Americans. Um, so she's trying to um, bring this to light. So I love the way that she got her name. Um, she's Shoshone and her grandmother uh, named her quick to see because she had a special ability to grasp things readily. Uh, she's still working today. Um, so you can see um, the chiefs, the braves, the Cleveland Indians, and so on. Um, so she's um, calling to mind the, uh, the way in which Native Americans have, have been treated uh, throughout history and even today. So the idea that um, this was in um, contemporary with uh, the celebration of the Columbus uh, Queen Centenary uh, celebration. So this is her anti-Columbus Queen Centenary uh, celebration. So she adds the red um, to symbolize the dripping blood um, as symbolic of the Native Americans' blood that's been shed. So these are also newspaper clippings there, so big collage. This is really quite large. Um, yeah, so 14 feet long, so that would fill this wall almost. I thought it said 50, maybe I read it. So five feet by 14 yeah. feet. That's a, another question. How do they determine why is it 14 feet uh -huh. and not 14 feet 2 inches instead of 13 feet? Uh -huh. For is there, Do they have it conceptualized and it comes out to 15 feet when they start doing it? Right. So uh, most, I mean, why didn't she make it 15, you know, make sure. it even number or whatever? Sure. Uh, so most of the time, um, artists use what's around. Yeah. They're not just, I mean, unless they're rich, right. they're not like ordering this stuff up. Uh, so she probably just had a piece of plywood that measured that. Oh, okay. It's just random. So a lot of times it's just practical reasons, yes. Okay. Like, yes. Mm -hmm. yes, yes, it does look through, like three together. That's good, good eyes. Yeah. yeah. Here's a, a wonderful one. This is by um, a Colombian artist. Her name is Doris Salcedo. Uh, this one is known as shibboleth. Does anybody know what a shibboleth is? I didn't know before I studied this piece. A shibboleth is a, sometimes it can be a word or some kind of action that when you can't do it right, it kind of outs you. So that means that, um, say I'm a non-native American uh, English speaker and um, I go to try to pronounce something that's kind of complicated. And so somebody asks me, can you pronounce this? And I can't, can't pronounce it. So then it kind of, means that I'm not like in the in-group. Mm -hmm. So that's what a shibboleth is. Um, and this one is based on um, just the idea of the other or things that divide us. So this one's quite amazing. Uh, this is in the Tate Modern uh, Museum in, in London, so it's a vast wow. open space. And what she did was, I don't know how she did this. She took cement, the cement floor, and I don't know if she raised the cement floor because the chasm is pretty deep. Um, she literally put a crack in the floor, and I have no idea how she did that. So there she is. She um, often works with common, ordinary objects, wooden furniture, clothing, concrete, grass, and rose petals. And um, so it's a 548-foot crack in the floor. Wow. It's just amazing. How do they get insurance um, for that? I don't know. I don't know how. I don't know. <laughs> and how, how do, like, the, I didn't see this one. And how do, like, you let people, like, walk in yeah. there? Are they going to break their legs? And, and devoting that much space. Yes, yes, it's to crazy. The museum, that's an awful lot of space. It's a lot of space. And what's mm -hmm. fascinating to me is this cross section of the crack. She was very intentional about how she wanted it to look. It looks um, like it has um, some kind of like, uh, you know, wire barrier to kind of keep the uh, cement at bay. Um, so the idea of connecting the immigrant experience in Europe, specifically the racial segregation of people from third world uh, due to their status as irrevocably other. So the idea of, um, you know, this great schism that sometimes separates one group from another group. I think it's really, really quite profound. Wow. Um, Would you go in there with a drill or Oh, something? God, I don't know how, I don't know. I, I, I've, I've tried to research it, or and nothing comes up. It's like a mystery to me. Get a jackhammer, yeah. and then she chiseled out. It, it, I don't know how she did that. Um, 
so the idea of yeah, the, the uh, us versus them kind of idea, and you can see people looking around. I also like okay. this uh, photograph because you can see the cross section of it and how it's um, really quite jagged and, and sort of dangerous looking too. Um, how does she present that to the museum that she wants to do that yeah, to so her it floor? Would, yeah, <laughs> it would have to be a whole um, presentation. It would wow. have to be all mapped out and planned out wow. and Jeez. schemes. And, and yeah, it's really amazing. <laughs> Uh, so the idea of segregation is emphasized by the wire mess, mesh embedded in the sides of the crack exposed in the floor. I love this one because you have two people uh, on either side of it and they're holding, holding hands. So um, just a way of which to shift people's perspective. It's really quite amazing. The museum's got to put that all together, you know, right. Right. And that, that was part of the that was part of the deal. So yeah. they said, yeah, sure, we'll 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 uh, you know have your show, uh, but you have to like repair it. And so yes, indeed, she yeah. repaired it. Oh, so you can you see it here. But the thing is, is that um, when you go in today, you'll see you know like a scar. So that's kind of interesting that that the the floor becomes sort of like a body part. Um, so the healing. Um, that might take place if you know two groups kind of decide um, to bring about some kind of harmony or um, a solution or a resolution. So that one's super cool. So that's that one. And then um, this is Ai Weiwei. I don't know if you've heard of him, but he's a mover and a shaker and an instigator and a provocator. And he is from China. And for the last, he's free now, but the Chinese just can't stand him. He's always doing really, um, really um, upsetting things, upsetting things for the Chinese. Like he took a ancient um, ceramic vase and just dropped it on the floor and it just crashed. Because uh, he was trying to, uh, I don't know, kind of like the idea of um, the preciousness of it is just sort of in your mind kind of thing. Um, but here it is, the sunflower seeds. So it's kind of interesting. I chose these two examples because they were they were housed in the same location. So this is also at the Tate Modern, was at the Tate Modern. So these are um, sculpted and painted porcelain, and they look like sunflower seeds. Oh so there he is. And when you, I have not seen them in person, but I saw them on video, and I saw them being made, and they are just meticulously made. And what they do is they harken back to, you know, the Chinese being so um, skilled at manipulating porcelain. And it's also a reflection of, um, you know, when we say like made in China, sometimes we yeah. say that in sort of a derogatory yeah. term as if it's sort of the cheap verge version yeah. of something like that. So he actually went to, um, went to a village he um, gathered the, uh, the clay, which was an old ancient um, place where uh, clay was being uh, harvested, and he followed right on through. The whole village was involved in the whole production of um, producing these um, porcelain sunflower seeds and then the painting of them. Uh, when this uh, was first uh, exhibited, people were allowed to like walk on the seeds and like lie on the seeds, and then I, I don't know how long it lasted for maybe just a couple of days and they were like oh no we got to shut it down because like they were afraid people were going to choke on them and I'm sure there were people stuffing their pockets with them you know so unfortunately that was very short-lived but you could observe it you know from a barricade or whatever unfortunately man wouldn't that be great to like be there right on the first day and you go romping around in these seats uh, in the video, it shows him, and he's um, he's romping around on the seeds, and it goes crunch, 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 and then he takes one of those, you know, the um, the rakes, like the Chinese rakes, they're sort of wooden, and he's like, you know, making them nice and um, uh, level and things like that. So it was a really interactive kind of thing. Uh, so 100 million, oh. 100 million. So I, t it took me three nights to count to 10,000. Yeah, who counted that? <laughs> I don't know, but. 100 million is just way too many sunflower seeds. And it just gives you some sense of uh, not only um, that oh, amount, but there's a lot of Chinese people. I just, I just came from, not just came from, this summer I went to Hong Kong, and every time I referred to like a, a city in China, uh, people would say, oh, that's a, that's a medium-sized city. And yet, there's millions and millions of people in those those medium-sized cities. So there's a lot, a lot of people. And um, so 1,600 Chinese artisans. Oh my gosh! 
Um, the other idea is that um, the sunflower seeds connected to food and hunger um, and a connection with um, you know Chairman Mao and the, and the sun, right? Because he was referred to as the sun. Because a lot of people, and well, you know this, that that you know, well, uh, Chinese, the Chinese just celebrated, what was it, how many years? 60? 60, 70 of the Cultural Revolution, right? So it's yay, yay, yay. Um, they don't, you know, place a lot of emphasis on the fact that, yes, there was a revolution, a cultural revolution, but a lot of people were very, very, I mean, they were starving. A lot of people died. Um, and I don't mean to be, you know, like, I'm not, I'm not saying that was, well, it was bad, but, you know, some things happened. But, you know, there was a lot of hunger during that time period, too. Um, so there were good things and some really bad things that happened as a result of that cultural revolution. And there the women are, uh, it happened to be all women, they were crafting them, and there's the seeds, oh my gosh. And you should see the, the video of, um, they, they hoist them up in these huge contractor bags, have you ever seen those big yeah. contractor bags? And they're like, they had to ship them all. I mean, it was tons and tons, it was incredible. Um, and so there's that term of made in China, which is uh, often sometimes like a derogatory term. Um, other themes, individualism versus collectivism. Uh, in China, because it is uh, communist, uh, there is the idea that um, you know, individualism is a sort of sacrifice for the collective good, um, kind of unlike what we have here. Uh, the strength of a people group united for a common cause, and then the idea of globalization and mass production of goods is all sort of wrapped up in that single one. Oh, those guys are the lucky ones. They get to like experience it. I don't know how many days it was open like that, but you know, eventually they shut it down, unfortunately. Um, so getting back to uh, Feliz Gonzalez Torres work. So this, this pile of candy in the corner, right? Like what the heck? Um, so basically what he was after is, um, he wanted to, um, uh, you know, bring about awareness. Uh, this was time of um, AIDS and um, uh, repression of uh, homosexuality and things like that. And he had a, a, a lover who was dying of AIDS. And so basically, um, he uh, his, his uh, lover's lover uh, weighed 175 pounds. And so the idea that as people took a piece of candy, it represented his lover sort of, you know, getting sicker and sicker and losing weight. And then the idea that it would, it was stipulated that the pile of candy would be replenished every day. So it, it um, is metaphorically granting perpetual life. So again, it's about context and meaning rather than the actual object. The object tends to be just the holder of the symbol of the meaning of the context. So I, we have to remember that one. I have a question. Yep. If you didn't explain that to me, I wouldn't look at that and yep. know that. Yes. So where other art you might look at and do it on, how do you do stuff like that That's on your right. own without you should, somebody explaining it? On yeah, I know yeah, that, yeah, but yeah, oh no. Well, right. sometimes they don't. No, no, but if they don't, I'm talking about if I look at a Da Vinci, yes. okay, I could, if I understand art, I could look at it and say, I can't do that with that. Correct, correct. <laughs> yeah, say? and that's how I kind of started tonight with it. It, it. For me, it evokes sometimes anger in me because I'm like, come on, you know, you gotta give me something, some kind of yeah. guideline that you can't expect me to know all this, that I have to sort of do my homework to experience it. Sometimes there's text, sometimes there's no text. And so really what the artist is trying to do is kind of letting us interpret it for ourselves. Um, you're right, you wouldn't pick up that, all that, with just looking at it and not reading any of the text, right? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the famous artists, you won't have to look at and could yeah, figure you get it, it out. Yeah, you get it. But this, right. I mean, yeah. and, and, and I there, know it's 175 pounds and the idea of, you know, eating the can, you know, Right. Who's going to think of that? Yeah, and it's not like it's a new idea. Um, you know, even say if we look at a Renaissance painting, uh, a lot of um, hidden symbols were used too. So uh, all of it was not revealed at you know at the first blush. So you know it's kind of an interesting uh, thing to look at it in terms of the context of like art history because a lot of this has its antecedents in in like 
you know, hidden symbolism. Because that like woman that. Sherman, I could look at her stuff mm -hmm. and get yeah. an idea Good. of what she's trying to yeah, convey yeah. more than I'd ever be able to do Absolutely. this. Absolutely. And I don't even know if somebody's, you know, an artist, never heard of this guy and looked at yeah. that and be able to figure that yeah. out. That's mm -hmm. right. So hopefully, you know, that uh, just by like listening to a few things tonight, it'll it'll kind of keep you like open to the idea that, yeah, there's something there. And so what is the something? And so it's not all, it's not, uh, or sometimes it is, but um, you know, most times there is some kind of thought process behind it. And then um, this I just wanted to leave with is the idea that, there's Duchamp again, and it's the idea that um, contemporary art often is, wants us to interact with it. So the idea that we're not always given everything. We're given little glimpses, and then we're allowed to put a part of ourselves into the artwork to come to our own conclusions. And um, I think that's a wonderful kind of dialogue that can happen. Um, so it's not like, okay, you walk up to a painting of a clown, and you're like, okay, I understand clown, or whatever. Um, that my most like fulfilling experiences is, is those in which I've really had to try to kind of figure it out that it isn't all given to me, you know, and that to me is like um, leaves leaves questions that I want to answer. So it always keeps me wanting more rather than just giving it to me. So the moral of the story is that um, you know, like I said, that this is not um, this is not new. It's been happening for a long time in terms of really challenging the status quo, right? Because when this thing came out, what happened? They're like, what are you doing? This yeah, is right. not art. Get it out of here. You right. know, like, oh, everybody was all upset. And, you know, that kind of thing. So we just have to put ourselves into, like, the shoes of, say, the people in the past and understand that there will always be, you know, the confusion when we see something new. And it isn't wonderful that we're being challenged by new ideas and new thoughts rather than just kind of like regurgitating or recycling different ideas. So that's, uh, that's kind of what, uh, what I wanted you to come away with. So that's about it. Um, so it, are there any questions? Thank you. Thank you, no, thank thank you. very much. Thank you. Yes. Is there any what's, kind of... What's your background? Yeah. Oh, my background, yes. And um, I'm, my, I'm sorry, I didn't introduce myself. Yes. My name is Ellen Nelson. Um, I'm a visual artist, and I'm also a um, arts instructor. So I work at the Hill School. I've been there for a while, for a long time. Um, uh, let's see, what, what's my background? Um, uh, I have a degree in speech pathology, and uh, after I realized as a senior in college I didn't want to do that, so then I went back to art and I practiced my art, got a teaching certificate, and then uh, eventually got a, a master's degree and uh, went to Moore College of Art and Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts and New Hampshire uh, Institute of, uh, of Art. So, yeah, kind of, but my love has always been art history. I kind of have that brain, you know, because I love the sort of like the kind of the structure of the history of it, but then I also like the creation of art. So for me, the art history really, is a, a really affinity to it. I've always been studying it forever and ever and ever. I minored it in college. Yeah. So any questions or comments or yeah, one, reflections? Yeah, they have this thing on TV now about country music, and it's okay. the same yes. thing you're saying, because the people that are doing it now, yes. the people like Hank Williams want recognize that to yes. say what is this country music that's right you know, same it's same kind of thing in any art which Ex music is exactly and if it's not doing that if it's not really provocating if it's not um leaving with a bunch of questions and even evoking right. like i can't take that you know that's usually a, a, a sign that you know maybe you want to like dig in slowly and and, and really try to yeah. investigate it. yeah there's, there's, there's something a, there there's something there there's there's a reason why it's well, number one, there's a reason why it's in a museum, if it ever gets in a museum, or even a gallery. There's something in it for you. They're pushing the edges. That's exactly. when some of these uh, country music exactly. folks came in, and they had the courage, so uh, to speak, exactly. to push the edges, just like that's, they did with the toilet and that's some correct. of these other things. That's right. That's exactly it. So and, and whatever um, you know, medium it is, theater, right, or music, yeah. same thing. Yeah, any of the arts. Any of the arts. Probably dancing. That's what we're supposed to do. Yeah, and dance, too. Yeah, that's what we're supposed to do. As soon as you think you've got a handle on it, man, it just 
scoot someplace else. And, and the other thing that I want to just say about um, contemporary art today is I have never, I, I, I don't think there has been in this history, in history, chronological, historical, world history, where a time where um, um, art is so um, inclusive and like socially conscious. Conscious. So that's really good. That's really good because I think today that's kind of the stuff we need. We need to be aware of uh, social injustice and things like that. So art, artists do. Yeah, yeah. That. Well, uh, so yes. Yeah. So that's fantastic. So and, like, and yes. there's a lot of artists that do that, but yes. maybe not as famous as some of these. Right. There's a ton of artists out there. They're not. That are social. But they're doing amazing work. And you know who? That which don't get mentioned, these people that do these giant murals. murals. And stuff. There's a place in New York. They they specialize. These guys specialize in huge murals, yeah. they, and more murals, and it's not just for you know advertising. A lot of it's advertising. Yeah. Amazing stuff when you think about. Well, even the murals this woman Teresa painted, mm -hmm. the one here, you know, yeah. the, and the one by yeah, the uh, pharmacy, the gate. That's I love it because it's kind of nostalgic. Mm -hmm. Didn't she do a pretty darn good job on those two murals? Philadelphia has more murals yeah. uh, per square mile than any other city in the world. Wouldn't you call that contemporary art? It's amazing. I just read that the other It's day. amazing, and it's all because, as far as I know, well, it started with one woman. I forget what her name was. Jane right? Golden. That's it. Yeah. You know her. It's just incredible. Isn't that amazing? You see what they're doing with the one that's going to be. Um, Obstructed by new construction. No. The high, what do they call it? The, Where is it? Uh, it's in Kensington. Um, Kensington. What do they call it? The high. BL? High definition oh, photography. Yeah. Uh -huh. She's. They're oh, wow. just taking the guy. When mm -hmm. they take fourteen hundred different photos, mm -hmm. and they'll be able to re reproduce reproduce yeah. that in in a cool. And the, the, they don't know where they're going to put it, but the, her oh, art is oh, safe. Good. It's going to it's going to be obstructed, but uh, because they, a lot of times you look, they lose the moral, murals because of knocking down buildings right. or right. And something then, goes up in front of it, you can't see it exactly. Anymore. And so nowadays you can actually like uh, paint or print onto like they call it parachute cloth, and then they adhere it to the building. So that's kind of cool too. murals really aren't law, law, uh, that new because when you think of the ancient uh, artists, they painted on the walls. Oh, they, that's they, right, Luxcal. <laughs> yes. And do you know that the same thing with motion pictures? They painted these artwork on the wall. Mm -hmm. They were like motion, you know, mm -hmm. one scene the after animation. another. Yes. And yes. It was just that's right. The same, the yeah, same. Cool. And that was amazing because they painted to the contours of whatever was on that rock. I know it. And I know same. that's what sort of started. I think. Yeah. They're down in there, and there's candlelight yeah. and firelight, and they see the little bump on the wall, right? Yeah. And they're like, oh, that kind of looks like a horse. And they had no lights. I know. It's really fascinating. Well, thank you so much for well, coming out you. tonight. Yay! Yeah,